Um, I want to announce our first speaker tonight. He is a uh, gentleman who wrote a... Who stole it? He wrote a book uh, a few years ago called Great Joy and Great Tribulation. And I had a chance uh, about a little over a year ago to meet Jim. I was on a uh, prophecy tour in South Texas. And this guy shows up and says, Hi, I'm, my name is Jim Searcy. And the uh, Lord wants me to give you this book. And, and read it and just tell me what you think about it. Folks, I read it. And it, uh, it's an amazing book. It, uh, it really is full of Scripture. And a lot of people write a book and they make a lot of money off of it. Jim wrote a book to get a message that God gave him to give to us for this time, for the 90s, for, for this age. Uh, I would highly recommend this book. It's great joy and great tribulation. It's going to erase a lot of uh, fears you have about the future. And how many of y'all have a few fears? Amen. This book has has opened a um, it has opened a lot of uh, scripture that once you read it, and the way that Jim has put this in text, it just brings a new light on the Bible, and it's just full of scripture. And I would uh, I want y'all to uh, uh, get to know this guy. He lives in. Uh, South Texas, and, and I, I love to go down to this place. We, uh, you can go out on this back porch and throw a little corn out and deer, just kind of walk up to the back porch. It's an amazing thing. It's kind of my retreat. When I'm stressed out here in Dallas and I need to get away for a weekend, I go down to South Texas and, and just kind of recoup at, at the Circe. This is just a great place. And, folks, you all are in for a unbelievable weekend this weekend we we put together the lord has put together some speakers for us to hear this weekend folks we've only been promoting this about two and a half weeks ago y'all just heard mark huey uh the lord is is told me said bo we want you to do a i want you to put this thing together and when the lord tells you something how many of y'all just do it right then i don't anybody can relate to that i didn't three days later the lord tells mark huey says mark I want you all to do a Bible Prophecy Conference this weekend. And so he calls me, and he's real serious. You all know how serious, Mark. He's real serious. He's telling me about what the Lord, and I start laughing, not in a mean way. And it kind of, I said, Mark, I said, the Lord just told me a week ago to do the same thing. So that's confirmed. And he said he will bless it. He would bring the people here that needs to hear this message. Amen. How many of you all feel like that you're here because the Lord wanted you to be? Amen. Okay. Would you help me give a great big Dallas welcome to our first speaker tonight, Mr. Jim Searcy. Hey, brother. Did y'all try something with me? Would y'all try saying, Alleluia, Yeshua. Let's try it again. Alleluia, Yeshua. You're going to hear this name, Yeshua. One of these days, everyone is going to look up and they're going to see whether they believe or not. They're going to look Yes, you are God. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. That's what the apostles called Him. Do you know He was Jewish? Do you know this is a Jewish book? It's hard to figure that out until you dispense with your dispensationalism. Now that's a bold thing to say in this city which is the center and the high citadel of dispensationalism. But I didn't know what I was to say. But as God gives me grace, I'm going to try and share truth with you as best I can. Say His name, Yeshua. Alleluia, Yeshua. Alleluia. Praise the Lord Jesus. Jesus. Say His name, Yeshua. Yeshua. Alleluia, Yeshua. It flows. It flows, doesn't it? We want to give Him glory. We want to give Him praise and glory. He has told us what He was going to do. 
There was the time when he went up on the Mount of Olives, and we have the Olivet Discourse as a result of two questions that were asked him as they were coming down off the mountain. All the apostles were Jews. Do you know that? You know, the church for 1,600 years has tried to get us to do away with the Jewish context of this Jewish book we call our Holy Bible. I'm not a Jew, but I'm part of Israel. Do you know what Israel means? It's a nation, sure. I've got a slide I want to have my brother put up. You know, this kind of gets off my topic, but I don't do good with topics. My topic was supposed to be the tribulation exposed. There was a 13-year-old girl right here in Dallas. She was asked to do a paper. She's in the eighth grade in a Christian school. She was asked to do a paper on a controversial subject. And her subject was, is a pre-tribulation rapture true or false? That's pretty controversial, isn't it? <laughs> I want to tell you that she had an A-plus on that paper. The best paper that was written. It's less than two pages long. One sentence in that paper says, I believe in a post-tribulation rapture because Jesus says it. Paul reiterates it. And John the Beloved explains it. How's that for a sentence from a 13-year-old? Think about it. I believe in a post-tribulation rapture because Jesus says so. That's a pretty good reason to believe it, isn't it? How do you know Jesus said so? Well, the apostles love this temple. It was the second temple. It was Zerubbabel's temple. They called it Herod's temple because he did a good job of remodeling it. Why? Why has the devil been working so hard to confuse us? He's the author of confusion. Let's think about Israel. What does Israel mean? The first time God mentions a word in the Scriptures, pay real close attention to it. Because he'll build on that. It really gives the best definition most of the time. And the first time we hear this word Israel, there's a wrestling match going on. And don't you know we all wrestle with God? Every one of us. We're born sinners. We're born thinking we're some sort of little God. And we wrestle with God. Just like this guy Jacob wrestled with Yeshua. That was Yeshua he was wrestling with. He wrestled all night with him. And he said, Wow, you really are God. Yes, you are God. And I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me. He said, Okay, I'll bless you. Your name is no longer going to be called Jacob. You know what Jacob means? That's us. We're all Jacob. Jacob means supplanter, trickster, cheater, liar. Everything that being born human represents. That's Jacob. We're all Jacob. But Jacob wrestled with God as we all wrestle with God. And he finally came to the conclusion that he wasn't God. And he says, I know that you are God, and I'm not going to let go of you until you bless me. And God said to him, I'll bless you. Your name will no longer be called Jacob, but it shall be called Israel, because as a prince, you have power with God and with man. You say, that's Old Testament. How about New Testament? John 1.14. Do 
To them gave he power to become sons of God, even to them who believe on his name. Israel is the name of the family of God. If you've been born again, you are Israel. You have been grafted in to that tree. You have been grafted in and become a partaker of the richness of the root, of the fatness of that olive tree called Israel. We are about to enter a time called the time of Jacob's trouble. And what I must tell you is that when we go into the time of Jacob's trouble, the God of Jacob is your only refuge. Your money isn't going to help. Whatever stuff you have is not going to help. It's the God of Jacob. And let me tell you something. I don't know a lot about God, but I know a couple of things. Three things I know about God. Number one, the only thing God can't do is lie. He can't lie. He always tells the truth. Satan, Lucifer, is the liar. He always lies. He'll tell some truth and he'll mix a little bit of lie in with it. But God can't lie. And... God doesn't change. Yeshua, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if God said, I'll bless those who bless you, and I'll curse those who curse you, believe it. You need the blessings of the God of Jacob in the time of Jacob's trouble. Part of your plans to endure to the end, and by the way, that was part of the answer Jesus gave. Part of your plans have got to be reaching out to Jacob. And it's glorious. We have seen more Jews come to know their own glorious Jewish Messiah, Yeshua, in the last 15, 20 years than in the last 15, 20 centuries. There's two things you need to tell the Jewish person. Only two. Trust the Holy Spirit to do all the rest. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Don't ever miss the opportunity to tell the Jew that. Because that's your bridge. That's your... Our righteousness is filled. We've got... Religion. And that's what the Jews have. Religion. Judaism today is not biblical Judaism. Judaism today is rabbinic Judaism. They don't have a temple. But some of them still believe Torah. And you'll strike a chord when you say, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. And then just tell them, and be careful to use the name that the apostles used, because Jesus is a curse word to most of them. Tell them, Yeshua can forgive your sins. That's it. Let the Holy Spirit work on those two things. You see, Jesus and Christ and the church represents a curse word. Because when Paul went out and started his churches, the first place he'd go, he'd always go to synagogue. And he'd preach Yeshua as the fulfillment of Messianic prophecy. He lasted 18 months in Corinth, but normally... Within a matter of a couple of weeks, they'd run him out. But there would always be this handful of Jews who recognized that he was telling the truth and would follow him and start a new synagogue which would open the doors of this new synagogue to the Gentiles because Israel has always been called by God and chosen by God to be a light to the nations. And when he came the first time, if they had accepted him, it was closed before Messiah came. Before Messiah came, 
there was no room for us except if we would become Jewish. And for a guy my age, that'd be tough. But Messiah came. And he broke down that dividing wall. As he hung there and poured out his blood, when the blood of Messiah hit the mercy seat, we were all bought and paid for. That's the gospel. 100% of the gospel is right there. When the blood of Messiah hit the mercy seat, we were all bought and paid for. Now, if we believe that, what are we going to do about it? He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now, there's a lot of people, if you want to go ahead and start keeping commandments, they're going to accuse you of being a legalist. But if my Lord said, if you love me, keep my commandments, what are His commandments? There's ten of them. Ten of them. Anybody know what the fourth one is? Uh, when did God change it? Do you think maybe that's why in Hebrews it said, Neglect not the assembling of yourselves together, and so much more as you see the day approaching? Begin meeting in your homes. About this time on Friday, when you come home, light two candles. And let's right now, let's stop. Do you realize we're keeping Sabbath? Maybe it's the first time in your life that some of you have kept the fourth commandment. We're going to keep the fourth commandment tomorrow, too. But the fourth commandment is still the fourth commandment. Now, there's one verse in Scripture that speaks against the Sabbath, Colossians 2.16. It says, don't let anybody put you under bondage in regard to new moons and festivals and Sabbaths and all this meats and all this other stuff. But there's 116 verses in the book that mention the Sabbath 137 times and there's blessings associated with it. And we have been robbed of those blessings associated with it for 1,600 years. You see, what I see God doing is restoring His church. Coming and bringing it full circle back to the way it really was in the book of Acts. Not the way we have changed it and modified it and recreated it, but bringing it all the way back to the way it was. Did they ever build a church building in the book of Acts? They met in homes. And before long, that may be the only place that we can meet. So get in a habit. When the sun goes down on Friday, light two candles. Bring your family together. If there are other families of like mind, bring them together in your home. Break some bread. Say, Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Alon. Amotzi Lechem. Minharetz. That's what Jesus said every time he broke bread. He never ate without saying that. What does it mean? Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. You can explain what that means to the Jew who's done it all his life because he's a Jew and doesn't know why. You know what it means. Yeshua is the bread of life. He is the living word. And he has come forth from the earth. The resurrection, folks. Every time a Jew has meal, he's saying something that he doesn't know what it means. And he's saying it, he's saying it because he's Jewish. You know, we're called to take the gospel to the Jew first and also the Gentile. We're called to make the Jew jealous. These things that the Jews have always done for 2,700 years, that they do just because they're Jewish, when we start doing them too, with understanding, I promise you, you will make the Jews jealous. And there's only two things you have to tell them. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. And Yeshua can forgive your sins. The Holy Spirit does it all anyhow. But if you want to be a witness, that's a good way. And celebrate the feast. How many in here have celebrated a Passover Seder? 
try and find one and do it. And when you see what these people have been doing for 2,700 years, you'll shake your head. I'll never forget the first one that I attended. You just shake your head. You say, wow, wow. Only God could give this kind of symbolism to point to Messiah. And when we start celebrating these Jewish feasts, and by the way, they're not Jewish feasts. These are my feasts, saith the Lord. They're not Jewish feasts. They're feasts of the Lord. When we start celebrating the Lord's feast with understanding, they're going to come in. And if you really want to be doing the thing that would be most pleasing to our King when He comes back, Isaiah 40, comfort ye. Comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned. What you have done to the least of these, my brethren, because you see, not too long from now, the prince is going to go over there and start off another one. And the propaganda is everywhere. And it's subtle. It's subtle. But the propaganda is there. There's another Holocaust coming. You see, Satan has always had his crosshairs on the Jew. There's a story about Frederick the Great of Prussia. He was an atheist. And I don't know if this is true. It's just a story. But he had a very pious medical doctor. One day he came in there and he says, prove to me that there's a God, but be quick, I don't have any time. The guy says, it's Jews, Your Majesty. You see, he understood the meaning of Israel and the meaning of the Jewish people in the context of this Jewish book we call our Bible. Because the very fact that these people still exist as an identifiable group under all of the attacks that Satan has thrown at them through history is some of the best proof of the reality of God. And that's why Satan has always been bent on wiping him out. Because so many of these promises apply to these people. If he could ever be successful at that, he'd win. But he can't win. He can't win. And we win. We get blessed when we figure out a way to be a blessing to them. Because this book in the New Testament says we're to be His witnesses to the Jew first. Most people are afraid to try and witness to the Jew. Don't be afraid of that anymore. The Spirit of God is being poured out. In Daniel, it talks about a lot of people who would be raised up in this time. People of wisdom, insight, and understanding. I believe that's going to happen to all of you during the course of tonight and tomorrow. And the call is that you would lead many to righteousness. That's what you're called to do. Now, when's he coming back? Soon. If somebody gets up in here and says, the Lord's coming back soon, everybody say amen, right? But if somebody gets up in here and says that the Lord will be back in the year 2000 to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles with us and have the marriage supper of the Lamb, which is, by the way, a millennial event. If somebody says that, you'd probably say, get that date setter out of here. Well, God's a date setter. And nobody knows the day or the hour, right? That's in the New Testament. Show me. In this book. In this book. Where you can't know the year and the month. I'm from Missouri. Show me. Anybody? Can you do it? You can't do it. Because when the apostles asked him those two questions, they said, Lord. Because you know what he said to him? He said, when they told him about this beautiful temple, 
He said, there's not going to be a stone left on another. Wow! Man, he had their attention. Because they loved this temple. And it was beautiful. He said, Lord, tell us, tell us, when will this be? And then they also said, Lord, tell us. When will be your coming in the end of the age? Two questions. A lot of people think it's just one, but there's two questions. When will the temple be destroyed? And what will be the sign of your coming? And you know, it's important enough that Yeshua gives us three whole chapters to answer that question. It must be pretty important because He doesn't waste His words. Matthew 24 is the best place to go. Read it from the Lord. He says a number of things in there. He says, there's going to come wars and rumors of wars and pestilences and famines and earthquakes in diverse places and the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world. A whole bunch of things. And we see these things happening. But they have been happening. They've been happening for 50 years. But if you go through that whole thing real carefully, looking for where he answers that question, what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? There's only one thing in there that will jump out at you. Verse 15. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, let him that reads understand. They had a scroll of Daniel. It was available that they could read and understand. I mean, that's the only thing in the whole thing that you can put your finger on and say, this is a specific event which will happen on a specific given day in history. This is going to come down. It will happen on a given day. Everything else is general. So, you go and you read Daniel. And you're reading Daniel and you're looking for this thing that Yeshua talked about. The abomination of desolation. And there's a verse that will jump right off the page at you. Daniel 9.27 And he shall confirm the covenant with the many ones for Shaboah, a seven-year period. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the oblation, the morning and evening sacrifice, to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations shall he make it desolate, and desolations are determined upon the desolate. Does that sound like the abomination of desolation? It's a little bit of strange talk, but that's the abomination of desolation. And people who have taught this La La Land doctrine that, whew, seven years or three and a half years before anything bad happens, you're going to be out of here. It's not what Yeshua said. Yeshua said in verse 13, He that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Now is the end seven years before the end? Or is the end three and a half years before the end? Or is the end the end? You know, He said, I am Alpha and Omega. He really said Aleph Tav. The beginning and the end. He didn't mean He's almost God, did He? No, He's God. Yes, you are God. Now, maybe you don't like me telling you there's no Santa Claus. <laughs> but until you dispense with your dispensationalism, you cannot read this book and see what these prophets are saying to us in this time. So he, who's he? He shall confirm the covenant. Who's he? Who's he? The Antichrist, right. The prince. He shall confirm the covenant. What's the covenant? Peace and safety. Paul says when they say peace and safety. And in even our great dispensational teachers, and please, I am not picking on people. I love these guys. You all do too. But if you've been to seminary and you're going to preach in America, you've got to learn this stuff. Because we're Americans. 
And as Americans, we all come from this stock of hard-working, God-fearing, risk-taking people who make plans and delight in carrying out those plans. That's true, isn't it? We're good planners. We're good executors of our plan. We all have our version of the American dream. That's part of who we are. Now, if we know that the Lord is really coming back, and we have a pretty good idea when He's coming back, I mean, if I tell you that He will be back for the Feast of Tabernacles in the year 2000, if I tell you that, it's going to change some plans, isn't it? What's that going to do to your building program? So, understand where these people are coming from. These are good people. But they have been deceived. And they teach you the same deception that they were forced to learn. I don't know if, but one guy who was able to get his Ph.D. from Dallas Theological, which is the top one, I only know of one who was able to get his Ph.D. maintaining an eschatology other than pre-trib, La La Land. He's all millennial. I don't, I don't know of any post, you know, I don't know of anybody who would stand up and say, how come if the Lord says, he that shall endure to the end, we're out of here before that. But you see, that's why it is. And this doctrine is setting us up for all kinds of things. Because these same people, years ago, used to tell us, they used to tell us, Always watch out if Israel makes a seven-year agreement with somebody. Well, folks, it happened. It happened. But they'll tell you, well, that couldn't be it because we haven't been raptured yet. <laughs> now, in the study of logic, that is what is called circular reasoning. And it's that same kind of circular reasoning when they're faced with the decision of surrendering all of their paper assets, their stocks, their IRAs, and everything when the banks crash to take this mark. Well, that can't be the mark. I haven't been raptured yet. Listen, you take that mark of the beast, it's blaspheming the Holy Ghost. You will go to hell. There is no repentance of it. It is blaspheming the Holy Ghost. Don't take the mark. Amen. If it means you've got to die, die. Because we don't die. You all know that? Do you all know that we don't die? I mean, we don't play fair. We don't play fair at all. You see, Yeshua waited till Lazarus was in the grave for days until he came down there. And he identified with Martha's grief. She said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. He wept. He identified with her grief. But in the midst of that grief, he looked her right in the eye. And he said, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He that liveth and believeth in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? If you believe this, you don't die. Now, they can kill this body. They can have my parts. I don't need them because I'm going to get a better set real soon. <laughs> now, I don't have a death wish, but I know my Lord. And my Lord said, as soon as He finished telling John who He was, Olive Toth, as soon as He finished telling him that, He said, fear not. Y'all ought to get you a good concordance and do a study on fear not. It is not optional. It is a command of the Lord. He has not given us a spirit of fear, but of peace and of love and a sound mind. Don't fear. Don't fear. If that fear wells up, it means you need some more faith. That's all it means. Now, how do you get faith? 
faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Read this. Read this. Read this. And you won't fear. Now, there's good faith and there's bad faith. Faith in your faith is faith gone astray. It's Christian occultism. Yeshua said, Have faith in God and you may say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and cast into the sea, and it'll get up and jump in the sea. That's good faith. Faith in God. But if you dare turn God into some sort of candy machine because you pull this lever, this candy bar has got to pop out, you have just entered into Christian occultism. The highest calling of God in Christ Jesus is to be counted worthy to suffer for Him. That's not a popular gospel, but that's what this book says. I'll give you a word of prophecy. In this order. You find this in Ezekiel chapter 12, starting at verse 21. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, what is that proverb that you have in the land of Israel, saying, The days are prolonged, and every vision faileth? Tell them, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will make this proverb to cease, and they shall no more use it as a proverb in Israel, but say unto them, The days are at hand, and the effect of every vision. For there shall no more be any vain vision, nor flattering divination within the house of Israel. For I am the Lord. I will speak, and the word that I shall speak shall come to pass, and it shall be no more prolonged. For in your days, O rebellious house, will I say the word and will perform it, saith the Lord God. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, behold, they of the house of Israel say, The vision that he seeth is for many days to come. And he prophesies of times that are far off. Therefore, say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, There shall none of my words be prolonged any more. But the word which I have spoken shall be done, saith the Lord God. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy. And say thou unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. O Israel, thy prophets are like foxes in the deserts. You have not gone up into the gaps, neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the battle of the day of the Lord. They have seen vanity and lying divination, saying, The Lord saith and the Lord hath not sent them. And they have made others to hope that they would confirm the word. Have you not seen a vain vision? And have you not spoken a lying divination, whereas you say, The Lord saith it, albeit I have not spoken? Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Because you have spoken vanity and seen lies, therefore, behold, I am against you, saith the Lord God. And my hand shall be upon the prophets that see vanity and the divine lies, and they shall not be in the assembly of my people, Neither shall they be written in the writing of the house of Israel. Neither shall they enter into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord God. Because, even because they have seduced my people, saying, Peace. And there was no peace. And one built up a wall, and lo, others daubed it with untempered mortar. I believe that the Lord would have me tell you that the time for this word of prophecy is now. The prophet will not flatter you. 
You can reduce the vocabulary of a true prophet of God to one word. Repent. <coughs> Repent. The judgment of God is coming. Repentance, it's not a dirty word. It's become a dirty word in many churches. It's not a dirty word. It's the most precious gift of God. God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. It's not His will that any perish, but that all come... Most people would say salvation. No. But that all would come to repentance. Today, if you'll hear His voice, harden not your heart. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Today, if you will hear His voice, harden not your heart. Let's look at Isaiah 40. Comfort ye. Comfort ye my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of him that cries in the wilderness. Hey, that's what we're doing. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every mountain shall be exalted and every... Excuse me. Every valley shall be exalted. And every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall be made straight. And the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. The voice said, Cry, and he said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and the goodness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withers and the flower fades, because the Spirit of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. O Zion that brings good tidings, get thee up to the high mountain. O Jerusalem that brings good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up. Be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold the Lord God will come with strong hand and His arm shall rule for Him. Behold, His reward is with Him, His work before Him. He shall feed His flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with His arm and carry them in His bosom and shall gently lead those that are with the young who has measured the water in the hollow of his hand and meted out the heavens with a span and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in balance. Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord or been his counselor? Who's taught him? With whom took he counsel? And who instructed him and taught him in the path of judgment? and taught him knowledge and showed to him the way of understanding. Behold, the nations are as a drop of the bucket and are counted as small dust of the balance. Behold, he takes up the isles as a very little thing. And leaven is not sufficient to burn, nor the beast thereof sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing, and they're counted to him less than nothing in vanity. To whom then? Will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare unto Him? The workman melts a graven image, and a goldsmith spreads it over with gold and casts silver chains. He's so impoverished that he has no oblation. He chooses a tree that will not rot. He seeks unto Him a cutting workman to prepare a graven image that shall not be moved. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Hath it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? 
It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretches out the heavens as a curtain, and spreads them out as a tent to dwell in, that brings the princes to nothing, and makes the judges of the earth as vanity. Yea, they shall not be planted. Yea, they shall not be sown. Yea, their stock shall not take root in the earth. He shall also blow upon them, and they shall wither, and the whirlwind shall take them away as stubble. To whom then will you liken me, or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things, that brings out their host by number. He calls them all by names, by the greatness of his might. For he is strong in power, not one faileth. Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God? Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard that the ends of the earth faileth not, neither is weary? There's no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagle. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Keep silence before me, O islands, and let the people renew their strength. Let them come near. Then let them speak. Let us come near together to judgment. Who raised up the righteous man from the east and called him to his foot, gave him the nations before him and made him rule over kings? He gave them as dust to his sword and driven stubble to his bow. He pursued them and passed safely, even by the way that he had not gone with his feet. Who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, the first and with the last, I am he, Aleph Tav. Fourteen times in Torah, that Aleph Tav, it's just stuck right in there. You know, the rabbis have scratched their head over this for years. The first one, I know where it's at, Bereshit Elohim Aleph Tav. In the beginning, God, Aleph Tav. Yeshua said, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning of the end. The isles saw it and feared. The ends of the earth were afraid, drew near and came they helped everyone his neighbor. If that ain't underline, underline it. They helped everyone his neighbor. Folks, God is pouring out his wisdom upon you even now. He will be laying specific burdens upon your hearts. And it's fascinating as I look and see what he's doing. Some he's calling to buy some property. Some he's calling to lay in some food. Some he's calling to lay in some clothes. Some, some medical things. But nobody has it at all. And, and, and you see, it's so neat to see what God is doing. He's going to force his people to come together like it was in the book of Acts. You know, where all had things in common. And none of them declared anything that he had his own. See? And that's what he's doing. Pay attention. He will tell you to do something. Because faith without works is dead. If you believe what he has said and what he has told us, it has to motivate you to do something. And you do what he tells you to do. Not what anybody else tells you to do. You do what he tells you to do. I must tell you something about the oblation altar. I must. Who knows what an oblation is? See, that's a kind of a technical word. It's in that verse, Daniel 9, 27. This definition of oblation comes from the Holman Bible Dictionary. It's a very concise definition. It's a very technical word. I would recommend you write it down. It's a good definition. You see, it's a gift offered at an altar or shrine, especially 
a voluntary gift not involving blood. Okay? Now, since it's a voluntary offering, it has nothing to do with sin. Because the sin offerings were required. And since none of the blood is put on the altar, since it doesn't involve sin, and it doesn't involve blood, it has nothing to do with the finished work of Messiah. Now, this is where our New Testament church, who don't need the Old Testament, are going to get in a lot of trouble. You see, because this whole thing is the Word of God. And he said that the Antichrist is going to go over and put a stop to this. And I've already heard some teachers, big-name teachers that I love, saying, wouldn't it be terrible if the Jews started sacrificing animals? We need to understand what this oblation is. Because if you will carefully read the book of Acts, let me just give you a few verses in the book of Acts that prove after Pentecost, you could not keep these apostles out of that temple in the morning and the evening. They would risk their lives. You could threaten them. You could beat them. You could lock them in prison, and if necessary, an angel would blow the doors off the jailhouse, and next morning, they would be in that temple, morning and evening. Even when... Saul was raising havoc in Jerusalem and everybody fled Jerusalem except the apostles. They didn't hide. They were the easiest people to find in Jerusalem. And that is for our benefit. We must understand that God established this thing as a separate part of the sacrificial system. It is not an abomination. Why were these apostles in there? Let me give you some of the verses. 246, 3, 1, 2, 3, 3, 8, 5, 19, 20, 21, 5, 25, 5, 42, 21, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 21, 26, 22, 17, 24, 17, 24, 18, 25, 8, 26, 21, and 26, 22. That's not comprehensive. There's more. Why were these apostles in that temple when these lambs were having their throats cut? And believe me, that is the most humane way to kill an animal. Do you know that? The animal doesn't feel a thing. It immediately goes to shock. It feels nothing. It's very humane. It doesn't look pretty, but it's very humane. You must understand this thing. Because our teaching, if we don't understand this thing, can have us lining up behind the Antichrist saying, let's do away with these bloody Christ-killer Jews. The Jews didn't kill Christ. I killed Him with my sins. And we better quit this kind of stuff. That greatest of all schisms, when we said, you can no longer celebrate the feast. You can no longer eat unleavened bread at Passover. You can no longer do anything Jewish and still be a follower of Messiah. When the church did that, that was the greatest schism in all history. And the Spirit of God is calling us to repent of the sins of our fathers, just like Daniel repented of the sins of his father. The Jews are not coming to Messiah, their own glorious Messiah, because of us, the Gentile church, which used that decision as a foundation for the killing of the Jews in the Crusades, in the Inquisition, in the pogroms, and the Holocaust. And they're going to use it again at the end. The battle cry of the Crusades was, kill a Jew and save your soul. How do you think Yeshua felt about that? It's time for us to repent. And come back and be this glorious church that we read about in the book of Acts. This Jewish church who kept the fourth commandment. You'll find more mentions of Sabbath in the book of Acts than you will the first day of the week. When does the Sabbath start? It starts at sundown on Friday, right? It ends at sundown on Saturday. Now, if these folks were praising God and the sun went down on Saturday, did they quit? Now, that doesn't 
doesn't mean you've got to go say, Pastor, we've got to change and we've got to worship on Sunday. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying in your home, and that's where it's to be done anyhow. At sundown on Friday, meet with the Lord on the day that He has chosen to meet with you in a special way. Because for 1,600 years now, we have been robbed of the blessings associated with keeping the fourth commandment. We're not under the law. Do we have to do it? No, we don't have to do it. But there are blessings. I can testify to you in three years' experience, four years' experience, there are blessings, precious blessings, that we have been robbed of. If you want to keep missing the blessings, you're free. We have a total glorious freedom in Messiah. So, What's this oblation thing all about? Let's go back where it was established. You'll find it in uh, Exodus chapter 28, starting at about verse 37. Exodus 28, verse 37. Exodus, actually, 29. Exodus 29, verse 37. Seven days thou shalt offer every day a bullock for a sin offering, for atonement, and thou shalt cleanse the altar when thou hast made an atonement for it, and thou shalt anoint it to sanctify it. Seven days thou shalt make an atonement for the altar and sanctify it, and it shall be an altar most holy. Whatsoever touches the altar shall be holy. Now this is that which thou shalt offer upon the altar two lambs of the first year, day by day, continually. Now, these are cute ones. They're less than a year old. You know, just... You know. One lamb thou shalt offer in the morning, and the other lamb thou shalt offer at evening. And with the one lamb, a tenth deal of flour mingled with the fourth part of a hen of beaten oil and the fourth part of a hen of wine for a drink offering. And the other lamb thou shalt offer at even and shalt do thereto according to the meat offering of the morning and according to the drink offering thereof for a sweet savor. An offering made by fire unto the Lord. This shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord, where I will meet with you to speak there unto thee. And there I will meet with the children of Israel, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. And I will sanctify the tabernacle and the congregation and the altar. There's a parallel passage. Let it be confirmed. In Numbers chapter 28. And Lord spake unto Moses, saying, and it's right from the top, Numbers 28, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel, and say unto them, My offering, my offering, and my bread for sacrifices made by fire for a sweet savor unto me, shall you observe to offer unto me in their due season. And thou shalt say unto them, This is the offering made by fire, which you shall offer unto the Lord two lambs of the first year without spot, day by day, for a continual burnt offering. One lamb shalt thou offer in the morning, and the other lamb shalt thou offer at even. And you can read the rest of it, and you should read the rest of it. God said to do this thing continual. Now the first one, in Exodus, they were still in a tabernacle. And God told, us to, told them to do this in a tabernacle. But He had also already told Moses that once you all get up into the promised land, there is one and only one place on the face of this earth that that can be done. Guess where? Temple Mount. And don't you know, that's what all the fuss is about. You see, the Muslims understand it, sadly, better than the Christians. The whole Intifada uprisings began when somebody wanted to try and set a cornerstone up there. Because if you're going to build a temple, what's important about the temple? Are the walls important? Yeah, the altar is what counts, isn't it? You see, because God said, you do this thing voluntarily, and because it doesn't involve blood, it has nothing to do with the finished work of Messiah. It is not an abomination. It is only a sweet savor. What does it mean? By doing this, and this is why you could not keep the apostles out of that temple, morning and evening after Pentecost. They were there with all the other Jews saying, we affirm you. God of Israel, because you own the fullness of the earth because you created it. But unlike all the other Jews who did not know Messiah, 
They had a double reason. You see, they could also say, we affirm you, O God of Israel, as owner of the fullness of the earth, because not only did you create it, you redeemed it. See, God created this fabulous world. He gave it to us. We, are to be, we were to have dominion over it. But Adam committed high treason, and Satan took it. And he had it. God had the power to take it away from him. But he didn't do it that way. That's why if the princes of this world had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. You see, when he hung there on the cross, he who knew no sin was made to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. True righteousness can only come from God. So don't speak against this altar. If you know people who will find this distasteful, try to explain it to them. It is not an abomination. It's a sweet savor. And we need to stand with those people. Because when you build a temple, look at Haggai verse 223. Last verse in Haggai, it says, I have appointed you, O Zerubbabel, as a signet, as a sign. What did Zerubbabel do? He was the one who built Zerubbabel's temple. He's a signet. Then the next book over, Zechariah, verse 4, verse 10, chapter 4. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth with the... We're all going to be measured the heart of everyone will be measured by our attitude toward that altar. What do you do with a plumb bob, plumb line? You measure things with it. And John, in Revelation chapter 11, verse 1, if this isn't marked in your Bible, make sure you mark this. John says, I was given a reed like unto a rod and told to go measure the temple and the altar and those that worship therein. Anybody that tells you they've got to rebuild the temple before the Antichrist can go over and do the abomination of desolation, all they're telling you is they've never read the book of Ezra. Ezra's a hard book to find. It's got a lot of genealogies in there. Most people don't spend a lot of time in Ezra. But you read Ezra chapter 3. Because when you're going to build a temple, the first thing you do is you set the cornerstone. Then you take measurements to know where the walls need to go and where the altar needs to go. And that altar, who, which affirms who the true God is, must be operational before you can put the first stone in that foundation of that temple. The altar is what it's all about. Satan doesn't want to do what's going to happen. We stand now on the verge of the fulfillment of Isaiah 17 and Amos chapter 1. The alignment of powers that God said would be are there. Anything can touch it off. Isaiah 17 says, Damascus will cease to be a city. It will be nothing but a ruinous heap. Amos chapter 1 tells us the same thing. You see, what's happened is all of these people are surrounded. You know, there is a league. Our Congress knows of the league of all the Arabs set against them. And, and Arafat just last week, before he came here, he was up visiting with the Kremlin, bringing them into the fracas. David Wilkerson has seen this vision. Henry Gruber has seen this vision. Dmitry Dudeman has seen this vision of our American coastlines going up in a strike. You see... Israel will not have a choice this time because this peace process, this insanity, has established a fifth column of somewhere between 50 and possibly 80,000 well-armed guerrillas within the borders of Israel. And when these guys are launching chemical and biological and possibly nuclear weapons into the land, Israel will have no choice but to hit Damascus. And they've got bigger ones than we do. And Damascus like the Word of God says, will cease to be a city. You see, he'll call Clinton and say, it's on the way down. And then he will call Cairo and say, do you want to be next? Then he'll call Baghdad, do you want to be next? Then he'll call Tehran, do you want to be next? Then he'll call Ankara, do you want to be next? The war will stop. 
And it won't take the IDF long to wipe and clean up Arafat's terrorists. And that's what they are, terrorists. The PLO police officers are almost all terrorists. And it won't take the IDF long. But that's how it's going to come down, because Israel will not have any choice. You see, part of being a Muslim is that any piece of Islamic turf that ever gets into the hands of Gentiles must, according to their religion, t be taken back. They've got them whipped up to their jihad frenzy. Now, when that happens, what's that going to do to our stock market? What's that going to do to worldwide economic systems? It's going to be a whole new world. So, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but pray about it. If you have any paper assets, maybe you should buy some food. Because there's coming this day when unless you take that mark, you have to kiss those paper assets goodbye. Now, the word of the Lord is fear not. We need to get excited about this. Our king's coming back. And the promise of all the prophets is that in those days, in these days that we are most privileged of all people to be living in, in these days He's going to pour out His Spirit on all flesh, filling us from the bottom of our feet to the top of our head. And the big thing is He says, before all these destructions come, He's going to send His angel out to seal us. I don't know about you. I've been filled with the Holy Ghost scores of times, but I leak a lot. <laughs> I need that seal. But we're talking about the Holy Spirit. Repent. Get ready because it is the Holy Spirit. Get your religion in the garbage can where it belongs. Get real with God. Get real. Get a relationship. Religion stinks to high heaven. There is no greater sin than that sin which says, you go stand over there. Don't get close to me. I'm holier than thou. God says that's a stink in my nose, a smoke in my nose that I hate worse than anything. We don't want religion. We've got to have this relationship with Him. If you don't have this relationship with Him, if you don't know what I'm talking about, about this relationship with Him, you find me somehow and get hold of this because you've got to have this. You've got to know what I'm talking about. You get hold of me. If there's more than I can talk to, I know some other people that know it just probably better than I do. But get excited because our King's coming back. You know what Jesus said? He said, the works that I do shall you do also, and greater works than these shall you do because I go to the Father. That's for us. That wasn't for the apostles. That's for us. You see, it's all coming down. There's going to be a great delusion. Michael is going to hear Yeshua say soon. The Father's going to say, okay, Yeshua, take charge. He will stand up and say, Michael, kick him out of here. They will kick him out. They're all coming down here. And these demons, you know what they call us? You know what these extraterrestrials call us? And all extraterrestrials, by the way, they're demons. If you don't know that they're demons, let me tell you, they are demons. And they are coming. If Jesus said there's demons... You better believe there's demons. I don't care if it's sophisticated. I don't care if your PhD tells you there ain't no such thing as demons. If Yeshua says there's demons, you better believe it. Let me tell you what these extraterrestrials call us humans. You know what they call us? Containers. You see, these guys are spirit beings. They're going to be kicked out of heaven finally. You know, all these angels, these good angels, they've been waiting for an eternity for God to say, God, why don't you bless this guy? Because he's still waltzing in and out of there saying, God, did you see what Jim just did? No, nope, he's covered with my blood. If I have repented, case dismissed. But the accuser of our brethren is soon going to be cast down. And he's coming down here. And if you take drugs, if you get drunk out of your mind, they're going to come in. And people are reaching out to them with yoga, transcendental meditation, new age, all this garbage. And they're going to get their container filled. Okay? But we're going to get our container filled with the power of the living God. And when that thousand ATF agents come up to my door, I'm going to say, go to hell in the name of Yeshua. Now, that's not good churchy talk, but it's effective. 
And I'm telling you, this is war. And that demon will not like to be reminded of his destiny. I tell him every day, you're a liar. I'm going to heaven. You're going to hell. Stick around me. I'm telling you again, I'm going to heaven because of the blood of Yeshua. And you're going to hell. Just tell them to go to hell. They don't like to hear it. And they'll go bug somebody else. Now you all be churchy if you want to be churchy. But God's looking for warriors who will stand up and realize who we are. We are people made in the image and likeness of God that He loves so much that He would get off His throne and go up on that cross for me. We don't understand this love. But we need to get hold of it. I thank you for letting me talk to you. Anybody in here going to speak against that altar? I've done my job. Praise God. Wow. Let's take a 10-minute break. No, let's take a 5-minute break. The restaurants are down in the corner. When you hear the music, please come back in and fill in so we can get started. Colonel Jim Ammerman is our next speaker. God bless you. God has preserved and is now presenting evidences of all of the major events that are mentioned in the Bible. And Satan, in anticipation of what God was about to do, has raised up stories about the Ark of the Covenant being in Ethiopia, about Noah's Ark being on Mount Ararat. He has brought all kinds of stories out to try to muddy the water and confuse the issues about these important things. Now, God says, My word will not return unto me void, but it will accomplish the thing whereunto it is sent. We live on a planet that has nearly six billion people. Many of these folks have been raised Hindus and Buddhists. They believe that their God is a piece of stone or a cobra, a deadly snake. And folks, if you and I had been born and raised there, we would believe the same thing. So let's don't fool ourselves. Christ died for these people. God loves them. And he has preserved these things and is now showing them so that everyone can see. The Bible tells us that we should be able to give a reason for the hope that is within us to them that ask. So anyway... God is providing these things that you will see here. And as quickly as possible, we're making them available to everybody. When we find people that are going into the mission fields, we supply them with free material so that they can show it. It's, this material is now being used in Russia, Japan, Korea, Africa, South America, and we are getting letters, phone calls, and that sort of thing, uh, telling the result that it has. Now, one of the things that really moved my heart, <clears throat> and Brother Groover is familiar with this, uh, I was at a university showing this material and answering questions afterwards. At the end of the program, uh, two men that I had been warned about that would chew me up and spit me out, bless their hearts, <laughs> came up and they had a few questions. Well, the Lord gave me a few answers for those men. Two years later, I got a letter from one of them, and it started off, it says, it may interest you to know that I am now a baptized follower of our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> So all of the darkness that Satan has created on this earth is not in Africa. There's a lot of people right here that have been taught things that are not true. And this man went on to say in his letter, he said, I had never heard it explained in a manner that I could believe before. 
Now, there are folks that just simply tell people the Bible says it, so you have got to believe it. Well, there's over 600 Protestant denominations in America.